Welcome, welcome to Game Changer Podcast. I'm David Villa. I'm here with Diana Villa. What is up? How are you this, today? Um, I'm today? doing wonderful. This is what we're this talking about today? Seizing the day. Seizing um, the day. Even if it's midnight right now, or if it's ten o'clock, whenever, whatever time it is, you're watching it. You gotta just round this up to the next day and seize that day. Well, I think even if it's midnight and you're listening, I think the um, most important thing for seizing your day is setting a plan. So prepare yeah. now. Prepare now for how you're going to conquer tomorrow. Um, prepare now for how you're going to conquer today. Whatever um, time frame you're listening to us, thinking about and from the perspective of preparation, because I think a major part of seizing your day is really about how you prepare for it. Yeah. A hundred percent. And it, it really is your, your, uh, your daily, um, your, your daily discipline, you know, what you do. And if you don't have one, you know, I would say that that is the first thing. First of all, when you're talking about seizing the day, when you're talking about seizing anything, right. You're, you're not talking about just like gently grabbing it or, you know, um, you know, halfway, you know, putting your hands on it. I mean, you're talking about, you know, deliberately, you know, I'm going to deliberately take a hold of this. And, um, you know, the day is something that I think a lot of times we take for granted because whether we seize it or not, the day happens, you know, time continues to tick. So it's one of these things where it's maybe not at the forefront of our mind. And then what we do is we get to the end of a day or we get to the end of three or four days or the end of a week or the end of a month. And we go, you know, th- my life is not on track or this, this, this situation is not on track. And we could always trace it back to like, what track are we laying? Because we, you know, we have to deliberately go after it. And I want to read a scripture that um, we're not strangers to in the church, but um, you know, it just, I think it, I can, I want to give it to you. And I think it may have a, you know, um, a slight different meaning if we really break it down and also add the 25th verse to it, which I've been doing now for years. Um, the 24th ver- f- verse I've heard since I was a kid in church, and it's in Psalms 118, 24 and 25, it says, this is the day the Lord has made, okay? So what's cool about that is it says, this is the day. So if I'm reading this today, then this is today. If I'm reading this tomorrow, then guess what? This is the day. If I'm reading this on Friday, this is the day. And so this is the day the Lord has made. We will rejoice and be glad in it, right? And then here's the 25th verse. Please, Lord, save us. Please, Lord, please give us success. So it's asking God, hey, this is the day you've made. We're going to rejoice and be glad in it. And God, give us success. Save us. And then in the easy version, um, I like it as well. It says, this is the day has, the Lord has done a great thing. We will be very happy today. And, you know, it's, it's kind of like one of these things where you're, 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 you're getting up. And if you're looking at, if you're, if you're reading that verse in the psalmist, you know, when, when, when it was written, I can imagine he's looking out. It probably was morning because he's looking out and he's, and he's taking hold, he's beholding the day. Because that's why, why else would he start the sentence off with this, right? So he's looking at it and maybe he's going through things. Maybe he's struggling. Maybe there's things, you know, chipping away at his faith as well. But he's looking at it and he's saying, this is the day the Lord has made. And I'm going to take control of this day. I'm going to give it to you, Lord. And by doing that, I'm going to deliberately lay my paths because they're going to be your paths. And so I think that's a really important thing where you said deliberately uh lay out the path. Mm -hmm. But I do think we have to relinquish control. This morning, as I was getting ready, I was listening to something I never heard of. And and I'm going to study this more in depth. But um, one of the things that says it's in this podcast I was listening to, it said, um, doubt is not the opposite of faith. Control is the opposite of faith. Because mm-hmm. faith is you, you're you trusting something greater than you, right? You're having faith in something greater than you. And control is what, if you take control, then you're not trusting it and relinquishing that. So, you know, I think what you <clears throat> said, lay, deliberately laying out, there's a difference of giving this day to the Lord and laying out, but then having the faith to allow him to lead you, which may go a little bit off the path that you planned. So I think we got to make sure that we, when we say control, we don't actually, you know, take the driver's seat. Well, if you think about it, control, I, I didn't hear that. This, this, that's pretty cool, though. But if you think about it, it really, they're really one and the same as well. Because you said that it, the, the person you were listening to said, doubt's not the opposite of faith, but the control is. But what is control? Control is I'm doubting you can do it. 
Like, you know, if, if I That's like true. to drive, you know, and I don't want you to drive, which is pretty accurate. Um, <laughs> my wife scares me. But the reality is the control I take is really my doubt in my safety if I'm in the passenger seat while you're driving. So, you know, it's, it's kind of one of those things where I think that th- that's a good way to look at it because I think sometimes we, we always look at it as doubt and we don't really like delve into what, 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 what are the outcomes of doubt because I doubt God, I take control. And, uh, and so in really they're one and the same as well, you know, um, not controlling your day and doing what you want to do, it's giving it to God, but it's in essence, you're, what you're doing is you're taking ownership of the day. So to seize the day, you have to own the day. You don't have to control the day, but you have to own the day and you have to realize that, 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 that it matters, you know, you have to make today count. And so, you know, um, the first step I think in, in owning our day, Diana, you know, in, in seizing the day is taking responsibility, my day, your day, it's our responsibility, right? You know, and what we do with our day is up to us. And at the end of our day, we can't look at our husband. We can't look at our wife. We can't look at our kids, our parents, our teachers, our friends and say, Hey, why did, why did I waste my day? You know? Why did I waste my day, right? The day's mine, and I have to take responsibility for it. So I think it comes down to the fact that I'm not a victim. We're not victims, and I think sometimes we have to, we you know, we we don't, uh, we may know this, but do we really, you know, do we really take responsibility as if we're not victims? And so our life circumstances, a lot of times, I know the ones that I've gone through a lot of times, there's, there's obviously things that happen to the just and unjust, but my life circumstances, you know, sometimes they're difficult. Sometimes they're hard. Sometimes, you know, I don't have control over them yet. I must master them. You know, I must, I, I have to, I have to take ownership of them or I'm going to spend my life being controlled by my past experiences. I immediately thought about, it's very easy to take responsibility when everything is going good. Mm, come on, preach. So we'll take responsibility for that type of stuff, but I think um, it's more When it's more going different. bad, it's your fault. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> Not mine, yours. No, yeah, yeah. My, my so fault. I think Mike's it's fault. easier when it's it's going well, it's easy to take responsibility, and that's a sense of pride, and that's where we got to keep that in line is, uh, you know, with our and our, and our motives probably. So I think it's easy to take responsibility in those seasons, but I think it's more difficult, but it's a growing time is when we can take responsibility for the things that didn't go right mm-hmm. and learn from them. So that's what's really important is not only take responsibility, but learn from them. Um, and I think that takes, um, you know, relinquishing that control. Back, it goes back down to that control and um, being able to be honest and transparent before the Lord you know, and to ourself, because we have to take responsibility. A lot of times it starts with first, you know, being honest with ourselves because, you know, deception causes us to not be honest with ourselves. Say, it's, it's okay. You know, I didn't, you know, it was only a little bit I did this or whatever. So I think that's, um, you know, not just taking responsibility in the good, but recognizing that there's growth in taking responsibility in, in the shortcomings and in the bad. Yeah, how about this one? When you look at and you find yourself in hard and difficult times and circumstances, and then you begin to take a look at it, right? And you're trying to find someone to blame, and then you realize it's your own choices that put you there. Woo! That'll sting, won't it? Come on, how many, how many, how many have done that? By the way, that's the first step in turning the Titanic around. That's the first step yeah. in turning this whole thing around, taking responsibility when we realize that, hey, you know what? I'm here because I made these choices and over a course of time and, you know, and this is the case a lot of times. And so, you know, did you make the decision that landed you where you are today? You know, that's the question you need to ask yourself, right? It's not to beat up on yourself. It's really so that you can turn this thing around and take responsibility for that decision, you know, but then move forward. And, um, you know, I, I think, if, you know, everybody always asks you how to be successful. And I think that, you know, if you want to be successful, the first thing you have to do is fully realize that you're the one and the only one responsible for yourself. And here's the thing. God can't make you love him. He can't make you follow him. He can't make you obey his word. And even he gives us a choice, you know. Um, and if he can't do it, and if he's not going to do it, then we certainly can't do that for other people. So we have to take responsibility, right? And remember, our choices are going to make or break us. We well, you know I want to stop there because sometimes we are a product of maybe our household or a bad relationship, or we're a product of that, mm-hmm. but we begin to recognize it. So I think at some point, even if you're a product of maybe, you know, 
something that was beyond your control. Mm. Um, maybe it was an abuse. Um, mm. You still at some point have to take control or take lay out that framework and go, you know what, I, I maybe this is something that I grew up in and, and, and it, maybe it's a bad pattern um, or a generational thing and you got to somewhere draw the line and then, you know, recognize, okay, I am, but now I have to take responsibility that how I move forward is predicated on my choices, not what I was brought up in, not, you know, what happened to me, not because of the relationship I was in, not because of the addiction I was in, not because of the hurt I was in, whatever that is, that trauma I was in. Now I've got to stop, draw a line and say, okay, from this day forward, this mm -hmm. is the day you've made, Lord. And so I'm going to take responsibility of how I take the next step, yeah. what direction I go. Yeah, And so if you, so let's look at it this way. If you want to have a successful day, let's start by making the choice to look for the good, right? Cho choose to think of how you can win instead of looking for reasons on how you can lose. Because if you just look, if you're going through a rut right now, or if you're, you haven't been taking ownership of your day and you know, this is resonating with you, you can't, you know, it's easy to look for reasons you could lose. It's easy to look for today and look at today and think this is going to be no different than yesterday or no different than, you know, uh, last week, or it's not gonna be any different than, than last month. You know, I, I, you know, I really have these issues going on and I don't see the light at the end of the tunnel, but if we want to have a successful day, we need to start by making the choice. And it's a choice. And, and choices go both ways. We need to make the choice to look for the good. Choose to think, how can I win, right, instead of reasons I can lose? And choose to focus on greatness, right? The easiest thing we can do is look for what's wrong. And can I just say this? That's the lazy way. And um, another thing I want to really go into, Diana, I want because I want to talk about owning the day. And I want to get your opinion on this. I know this is more on the surface level something I would do. So I'm interested to hear what you think on this as well. So another way we can, you know, own the day, achieve our goals in the day is name our day. Okay. So let's just say this, I'm, I'm, I'm a CEO and, and I'm in charge of, you know, more of my role as a CEO, sales, marketing kind of concepts, really the driving force, so to speak. So I'm going to call this day, the day of productivity. That's my day, right? Today is my day of productivity. So when your day has a name, Right, you have a focus in your mind, and I feel like you'll be able to make the small choices and decisions that are necessary to keep your day on track. So if I get if I get off track, you know, and I start getting off track, and all of a sudden something pops up in my mind because I've I've conditioned it that hey, today's my day of productivity. Is this being productive? And so the choices that day, I I feel could be maybe based on your day's name or your day's goal. What do you think about that? What do you think about naming your day? Is that too? Is that too? No, I think that's a really good thing. So, <clears throat> and I don't know how this is going to. What come would your out. day name be? What would your day be like? Well, you know, I'll let you think about that. Go ahead and make your comment. How this going to come out, and then I want you to um, think about. I'm thinking first where you said think positive. So I think it starts with our thoughts, mm. of like aligning our thoughts, and then once we determine, okay, you know, today this is a day that I need to accomplish this, or I, you know, we name it. Then it comes from our thoughts to a declaration of our mouth. Mm. And then I think we have mm. to allow our heart to meditate on that so that even when our thoughts contradict what we already set forth mm. and our mouth maybe begins to sway and say, shoot, I'm not going to be productive. I'm not going to get through my tasks. That we let the me meditation of our heart, meaning, hey, Lord, you have um, equip me to accomplish everything that you have for me to accomplish today. So I think it comes back to our thoughts, our words, and the meditation of our heart. And I think it's the meditation of our heart that dictates our actions, the steps we take, the moves. A thought's okay, right? But we got to quickly begin to, you know, like, I'm not going to finish, you know, whatever it is today. I'm, I'm not going to be productive or, you know, today I, I, you know, needed to do this. Our thought is that. That was a good intentions. Thoughts are good intentions, then what are we declaring? And then are we allowing our, it to be filtered through our heart and put it into action? Mm. That's good. So, so every day doesn't have to be different. Or the morning doesn't have to be different than the afternoon. So maybe you need several days of productivity. You know, maybe you need a week of productivity. Maybe you need, you know, um, I mean, you, maybe you need a day of decision, right? A day of study, a day of organizing. Maybe you need a day of joy. Oof. Maybe you need a day of hope. A day of efficiency. Yeah. Preparation. Helpfulness. Come on, throw them in. Refreshing. What you, rejuvenation. Yeah. We're getting we're getting pretty getting jiggy with it. You know, at our leadership meeting last week, and I don't remember because it was on my mind then, but it was like we were talking about the fruits of the spirit, but it was about um, 
you know, I'm not going to allow external circumstances dictate my emotions that I know that, you know, how do you keep faith in a season of pressure? How do you keep joy in a season of maybe your experience loss? How do you keep um, faith in a time where you feel like there's no way out? Is that it comes from an internal assurance that no matter what you face today, God is with you and he's gone before you and he has equipped you and he calls you the head and not the tail, that he will make a way where there seems to be no way, that he gives you beauty for ashes, that he has made you and enables you to be more than a conqueror through Christ Jesus. Like it's, you have to have that eternal, internal assurance so that when the things come from an external, how you seize your day, the external circumstances come, which will sway you from preventing you from to accomplish whatever it is that you set forth and you thought about, declared, and, and meditated your heart. It's that internal. So I think it really boils back down to what is in your heart. Yeah. And, and when, you, when, you, when you name something, it becomes personal. Yeah. So, I mean, they, it has a meaning to it, right? I mean, you named your kids. You know, when your kids were born, you named them. You just don't call them, hey, kid. You know, you you name them. You name your pets. You name, you know, you name things. And so, you know, in the gospel, you know, Jesus named, renamed Simon to Peter, which meant the rock. You know, Peter then had to live up to, you know, and he had to become the man that fulfilled that name, right? His life calling was in his name, if you think about it. So you, so name, naming your day is a way to, to seize the day, is a way to own the day. It makes it have meaning. And, um, you know, let me ask you this. Um, I've got a few more minutes. What about words? You know, um, we talked about this in our leadership meeting yesterday. You know, you can't own your day until you own your words. Yeah. So there's 26 letters, right, in the alphabet, A to Z, and these letters rule the world, and they have power. The Bible says... You know, the Bible clearly states that the power of life and death is in the tongue. And then it says that we'll eat the fruit thereof. So words can inspire, words can encourage. You know, and whoever said that, you know, sticks and stones, you know, will break my bones, but words can never hurt me. Really, that person was wrong because the reality, words have enormous power. You know, I'd rather be punched (laughs) and heal from a bruise very quickly then um, be tore down with a word that pierces my heart. An mm. external bruise can Heals heal very quickly and, and heal without any imperfection, but a word can be so damaging. So I think that, um, you know, our words are, are pivotal. And, you know, we want to make sure that we're speaking words over people. You know, but then again, at some point, even if people have spoken you know, words of discouragement or, or negative words against you. At some point, you have to draw the line and decide that you are not a product of where you've come from or what you're in, but you are a child of the living God mm. that has more for you and begin to see yourself as his child and want to... Um, move forward and that in spite of. So I feel like, um, you know, words are important. And I, and I talked about this in, in Make It Happen yesterday that, um, you know, there's been studies I couldn't find. I actually Googled it, but I couldn't find. But I remember hearing stories of plants being put in rooms that were putting positive words and then in a room that negative words and then in a dark room where there's no um, communication and that there were visible differences of how those plants grew, wilted, or died. Mm. And obviously the one with the positive words um, were, were, were flourishing. They were, they were growing. And um, it's interesting is because I kind of remember my mom. I was a kid. My mom and my dad both were able to – they had green thumbs, and, and my son got that. I kill everything. I, cl- I kill artificial plants too. <laughs> but um, – and I kind of remember my mom kind of talking to, she had ferns. I kind of remember my mom having ferns and spider plants. And um, she talked to them. <laughs> and I always kind of thought she was crazy, but maybe she maybe she knew something. No, she's crazy. <laughs> no, we, we love her if she's listening. She, But she's, she, yeah, it's, there's a point to that words matter. Yeah. And if you speak life over something 
and you speak death over something, you know, the, the, the thing that you speak death over will suffer. The thing that you speak life over will grow. And, you know, Hey, no words is still saying something. Yeah. I mean, this says, yes, there's some interesting point because when I was studying this out for a Bible plan back a couple of years ago, speak life, you know, you can speak life and you can speak death and then you can speak nothing, you know, and um, just because you're not speaking death doesn't mean you're speaking life, you know, and um, words are important. The Bible says that God says about his word, he said that my word <clears throat> will not return void, but it will, it will accomplish the very thing that he set out for it to accomplish. I mean, so he speaks of his word and, and look in the beginning where it says the earth in Genesis was without form and it was void. And then here's what God did. He spoke, he moved, but he spoke and he said, let there be light. And then he began to speak things into existence. There's power in the word and there's power in the spoken word and there's power in God's word. And, uh, and you really want to see something powerful when you begin to, because the real definition of speaking life is when you line up your speech with God's word, when you begin to speak and your words become his words, your, your words become it, a mirror and mimic what his word says. It, 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 you know, it amens his word, because here's the thing. God's not required to bring to pass what you say. He's required to bring to pass what he says. He's not required to do what, bring, bring about what we say. But he is required to bring about what he says. He says, heaven and earth will pass away, but my word, his word, will not fail and will not fade and, and will remain. And so, you know, understand there's power in words. You know, uh, we were talking about taming the tongue. The Bible says that the tongue is the one thing that a man can't tame. And then Mikey, in our leadership meeting yesterday, pointed something out because we know the scripture that says, you know, from my heart, right, our, from our heart, our mouth speak. Well, if you can't tame the tongue, a tongue is just a mouthpiece. It's going to speak what's in the heart. It's going to it's going to form the sound and the words and the syllables and the sentences in the in the paragraphs in the in the in the declarations that are in the heart. So you want to you you want to own your day, then then begin to own your words. Well, I think um, there's a, a old <clears throat> saying that repetition builds recognition. Mm -hmm. I think you just keep saying it, and then finally, you eventually you believe it. Because how many of us have be believed lies? You know, the lies of the enemy that have told us that we're no good or we're worthless or we'll never make it. We believed it because it was continuously ringing. So I think you have to declare it with your mouth until your mind takes a hold of it and it penetrates your heart and that you actually believe it. So I think words are important because if you say it to yourself, and I don't think it's always, I mean, obviously reading the word of God, but I think it's not just enough to read the word of God. You have to declare it. Yeah. You have to say it. Yeah. You have to, you know, meditate on it. But I think declaring it, there is something to that. And it, and, and it serves as a reminder to you. It serves as a reminder to the enemy. It may serve as a reminder, you know, to the people around you, but you need to be declaring it, declaring it, declaring it um, until it, you know, is, is you believe it. Absolutely. And you know, we need to speak w with the goal of, of building up, you know, yeah. Um, the, the Bible is in God's plan is all about building our lives, right. And building his kingdom and, and building, it's not tearing down, right. It's, it's, he's a good God. And regardless of what goes on in this world, we, we serve a God who is a builder and he's a God who always wants to build up. So we speak with the goal of building up. We see the good in every circumstance. We, 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 we quote and declare Romans eight twenty eight, which says all things work together for the good to them that love God and to them that are the called according to his purpose. It doesn't say that he only works the good things out. It doesn't say that he only works things that are good or works with things that are good, but he works all things to the good. You know, I, I kind of think about, you know, you know, God has a plan for us, and sometimes our choices <clears throat> takes us off that path, and maybe we get to plan B because of choices we made, but God's so good that he'll make plan B be better for you. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> Right. There's a plan B because he says that he'll make a way of escape for us. Right. So he set out plan A. We have choices. We get off the beaten path and now we have to go to plan B. But he's not going to leave you with less. Right. He's going to give you more. So I think plan B under the context of following the leading of the Holy Spirit and being in his will can be better than plan A. 
hundred percent. Let me give you a couple of scriptures here as we wrap up today. It's been a great, great podcast. I've enjoyed this. I hope you have as well. If this has been a blessing to you, um, make sure you share this, go to YouTube and you can share it. Or if you're listening to this on iTunes or Spotify, you can share this with someone if this is a blessing to you. But Psalms 19, 14 says, may the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be pleasing to you. It's interesting how God links those two together. May the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart. And a lot of times those two are going to be completely synonymous, right? I'm going to, what I'm saying is what I'm meditating on because from my heart, my mouth speaks. So may the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be pleasing to you. O Lord, my rock and my redeemer, Psalms 19, 14. Here's another one in Psalm, uh, Proverbs 16, 24. Kind words are like honey, sweet to the soul and healthy for the body. And um, that's, that's a good one. And, uh, you know, it's interesting because if you think about how many times we jack things up, right? How many times we jack our day up? How many times we didn't own it? How many times it owned us? And how many times you find yourself, you know, asking, repenting and saying, God, I'm sorry and help me be better. And, you know, I want to turn this thing around. And, and then here's the thing. He always speaks a kind word. He never goes, I told you so. He never, you know, uses harsh words. He speaks kind words to you and he, and he pulls out his word and it's always to bring you back. No, I want to say one thing. In that scripture, Psalms 1914, may the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart, my heart be pleasing to you, O Lord, my rock and my redeemer. We can have words that are pleasing to the Lord and the meditation of heart, but how about many know that even sometimes in the middle of that, we have a bad thought and that's okay, a negative thought. And here's the thing, the good news, the, the Bible talks about that we're able to pull down those things. Mm -hmm. So it's okay if you find yourself that, you know what, I you know, I feel like my words are declaring and my heart is, is you know, steadfast after the Lord, but I keep having these negative thoughts. That is okay. You're not abnormal, but recognize it and pull it down and declare, keep Amen. declaring. And then, you know, filter all those things through your heart. So. Amen. Amen. Hey, I hope you guys enjoyed today's podcast, Owning the Day. So how many are ready to own the day, whatever day it is? I hope you guys have a wonderful, wonderful day in Jesus' name. We'll talk to you next week on Game Changer.